Okay, no, this is uh, this is November twentieth, two thousand twenty-three, and I'm look. We are looking right now at the schedule of classes, and and just just a reminder that the exam is going to the third the exam is going to be on Wednesday, the day after tomorrow, chapters five, six, and seven, plus labs three, four, and five. Uh, you know what? I'm going to put lab four only here. Right? Let's put lab, labs three and four only. Okay. And let's go to the notes right in here. Let me close some windows first. More students coming in. Okay, so what I did so far, one, I posted the correction for lab four. I uh, posted the correction for the report of lab four. Check your group folder. Please check your group folder. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll check it for, for the report of group five, of lab five, but I didn't see many out there. There looks like there was just one group that uploaded it. Google Drive, right? So let's take a look. Spring fall, let's see, physics six. Okay, so let's see, report for, okay, group one, no report for lab five. I believe that most likely group one doesn't exist anymore, right? Because some of the students that was in this group dropped, he go. Group two, yeah, group two posted the report for group five. Let's take a look at group three. Yeah, group three also did that. Okay. And let's take a look. Uh, group three. 14. Let's see, group four. Yeah, group four didn't post it. And so, uh, yeah, group five didn't post it. Okay, so I want to give you an opportunity. I want to give an opportunity to upload. I want to give you an opportunity to upload the report for lab five. That's why I didn't correct that. There were only two, two groups in there. And I will by, by postponing it's due date. Due date to, let's take a look here. It's due date. Since we're going to have an exam on Wednesday, right? So I will postpone it, it to November 29th. I postponed it to, to November 29th, 23, okay? So now lab five is due on November 29th. Report for lab five is due November 29th. See here? Uh, I'm from group four, the rest of my group dropped. Okay, so let's see. And Marco Sanchez, right? Okay. So we have only, let's see, let's see. 
I believe it was group two and some of the group that posted because for 50 for that day. Okay. Good morning. Okay, it was group two that day you said to join. Yeah, that's right. I remember that. I remember, I remember that, Marco. Yeah. And but I believe we had a third group, didn't we? And let's see. Let's let's take a look here at my at my roster. That's the roster here, right? Gael is here. Yeah, Gael Garcia is here. Okay, okay, Gael. I didn't take attendance for the last one, right? Yeah, I didn't take attendance for the last one because we were without electricity uh, for some of it. Seven. We didn't have a lab, but we have a lecture, right? Uh, electricity off. The off. Okay. Yeah, part of it was electricity off. Uh, partial, partially, right? <laughs> lecture plus electricity, electricity off. Let's put this way, just, a, just as a reminder. I still have uh, an attendance because the meeting was recorded. So I can check the recording of the meeting to give you give you attendance, right? So let's see. Gael is here, right, Gael? Hello, Gael. Gael Garcia. I don't hear from Gael. Let me check one more thing here. Well, Garcia, um, <laughs> was in which group last time? Let's see here. Eight. Okay, Garcia didn't come last time. Okay, read one. You're you're here, right? Yes, and who is in your group? Is that Ashley and Annabelle or they dropped? Ashley, uh, I'm asking the read one. You don't know? Let me see here, right here. can find that out here by myself, hanging there. Okay, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, it looks like we have, we have nine students. So let's see, Gaia is still here, is still registered. Let's see, Sky is also, Sky is here today. Uh, uh, Garcia. Read one, read one is here. I'm going to Sky, read one. Lee Izumo, okay, Ashley is still here, not sure. Yeah, but I can try giving. Uh, yeah, actually, it's still registered. Okay, so push Ashley and Norberto. Norberto is also registered. Vanessa Mena is also. Vanessa is here, right? Yeah, I'm here, Professor. Okay, thank you. Katarina Katherine Pacheco is also Camden is here. And Marco Sanchez. Okay, so it looks like an looks like Annabelle dropped. It looks like Annabelle dropped. 
let's move that here elsewhere. It looks like, because she's not listed here, Annabelle Madrigal. Yeah, okay, so if she dropped, let, let me just copy and paste here. Okay, so if she dropped, we have, we still have group two, right? We have group three. Apparently, Marco Daniel is, is alone in his group four. And then we have Sky and Catherine. Let's see who else is coming. Not bad, though. Okay, so it looks like we still have five, three groups. We still have at least three groups. So let's... Let's do what I said. Let's uh, put the, you know, due date for the report of lab five for November 29. Let's leave this way. Okay. And let me take attendance too, quickly. Sky, I don't see Sky here. Destiny? Mm, oh no, Destiny Garcia. Destiny Garcia. Doesn't look like she's here either. Yeah, okay, she dropped. Gael Garcia is still here, right? Hi, Gael. Let me know that you're here. Okay, I'm going to put a star on Gael Garcia's attendance. Read one is definitely here. Ashley. Ashley is here. I don't see Ashley. Norberto Lopez. Yeah, yeah I'm here. Thank you, Norberto. Annabella. So it looks like Annabelle dropped. Vanessa is here, right, Vanessa? Yes. Okay, thank you. Catherine Pacheco. I'll get to you, Camden, hang in there. Catherine Pacheco, let's see. I don't see Catherine Pacheco in my list here. Next is Camden. Okay, Camden is here. Victoria Preciado. Victoria Preciado. Okay. And, and then we have Marco Sanchez is here, right, Marco? One, two, three, nine. Okay. One, two, two. Okay. So Gael is is signed on, but he's not answering for my calls. Okay. So we. So let's continue. What what did you do you do there? Okay, let me just remind you what we did last time. We are looking for. One twenty right in here. Uh, 
Okay, we were doing this problem here, this example. Okay, so let me copy and paste what the table that we were doing last time. So you can have a better qualitative idea of those uh, angular parameters that we have been playing with. Okay, here you go. Equilibrium. What we have to add here? We have to add here the idea of inertia. Did I put it here, inertia? No, we didn't put inertia. So inertia, we have what we call linear inertia with the mass, which is the mass, right? Represented by the letter M. The unit of inertia, of linear inertia is the kilogram. And then we have what we call the angular inertia that I call it moment of inertia. Moment of inertia. And we abbreviate by the letter I. The unit for moment of inertia is the kilogram meter square. Okay, so what's the idea? What is the concept of inertia, right? What's the concept of inertia? Inertia is a property, is a property of objects that have mass. Okay, this property the higher the inertia, the higher the inertia of an object, comma, the more difficult it is to change its state of motion, okay? And my change is a and the change, the change in the state of motion must be affected by a force, a force or a torque, a force for the case of the linear inertia, right? So if you want to change, here you go, a mass, if it is at rest, okay, it needs a force to make it move. Just like Newton's, Newton's second law of motion, the mass that is at rest has an acceleration equal to zero. To make it, it a, a different acceleration, you have to apply a force. The higher the inertia of this mass, the higher the force that you have to apply, okay? It depends only on the mass. This, this linear inertia, depends only on the mass of the object, okay? In the case of linear inertia, comma, it depends only on the mass of the object. That's what inertia, that's what the idea of inertia is all about. It has to do with the state of motion of an object. And by state of motion, you know, the object, if an object is at rest or moving with constant velocity, right? If you want to change its state of motion, you need to apply a force. If you don't apply the force, the state of motion of the object remains the same. Okay. Now, in the case, like I said, in the case of linear inertia, linear inertia depends only on the mass of the object. However, however, on the case of angular inertia, comma, it depends not just of not just on the mass of the object, but also on its distribution. Okay, different distributions of the mass, of the same mass, 
Now, wait a minute. It's not the only distribution. It depends on its distribution with respect to the axis of rotation, okay? That's better like that. Different distributions of the same mass. Uh, it depends on the case of Miller. It depends not just on the mass of the object, but also on the, its distribution with respect to the axis of rotation. Uh, not, not distribution, with its position, okay? Here you go. Its position with respect to the axis of rotation. The position of the mass with respect to the axis of rotation. Different positions, okay? Of the same uh, mass. This uh, Now I can put mass distribution, okay? And the uh, home decay, it depends not just on the mass of the object, but also on its position with respect to the axis of rotation. Different positions of the same mass distribution result, result in different moment of inertia. And here we have an example that we did last class. See here, we have the same mass distribution, okay? They are exactly the same object, the same object with the same mass distribution, but the position, the position of the masses of this object with respect to the axis are different, okay? If I go ahead and put an object to rotate about this axis, I find a, a given value of moment of inertia. However, if I, if I make the object rotate about another axis, this axis here, I get another moment of inertia. In this, those two cases, the moment of inertia of this object is less than the moment of inertia of this one. It's far more, it's more difficult, not far more difficult, it's more difficult to make this object rotate around this axis than to make this object rotate around this axis. Then to make the same object rotate around another axis. Okay? That's what the measurement of inertia is all about. And when we go, when we are talking about rotational inertia, two, the same objects, they have uh, different states of inertia. The same object with the same mass distribution may have different states of inertia. So let's go back to the notes right here. In the case of the previous example, you know, what's the previous example? The baton with four masses fixed at the end of two rods of negligible mass, negligible mass, come on, come on. We end up having diff different values for the moment of inertia because of the two different axes. Axes, okay. So now what I'm going to do, you go. I'm going to compare those two drawings. View, grid line. So that's the qualitative idea that you must have about moment of inertia. Good. This one here.
insert table it go that's one one object rotating about one axis because we treat this one as a second example right I'm putting here on the right side of the of the table and the other one Good. Same object rotating about a different axis now. Okay, okay, I know why. Okay, good. Okay. A and B. A and B. Okay. Marcel, two objects, exactly the same mass distribution. If, however, however, if you put it to rotate about a different axis. Come on. It's inertia, it's moment of inertia is going to be different. In the above, Object in B. At a lower moment of inertia compared to A. So that's the illustration I want to give to you. And the example as well. So you can have a better idea what moment of inertia is all about. So you start thinking what would be the would be the moment of inertia if I were to to this object, if I were to measure it or calculate it with respect to this point of rotation right in here, to this axis coming out towards you, about this axis, about this axis, about this axis, or let's say about this axis, about this axis about this axis or this axis and so on, okay? Think about that. And even about this axis too, you may get different moment of inertia. The moment of inertia in other, in other way. So the moment of inertia depends on the axis of rotation. That's the important lesson to take from here.
now, okay. And I'm going to have to do now. The above formula. Uh, we did the above. You know, we did the above for a distribution of point masses. Right? What about a uniform distribution? And what do I mean about the uniform? What about the uniform distribution? Not just point masses. Okay, but something more complex, like a rod, for instance, this rod. What would be the moment of inertia of this rod? Okay, what would be the moment of inertia of a disk? That's what I mean by a continuous distribution of mass. What would be the moment of inertia of a triangle, of a rectangle, and so on? Okay. So we're going to do the, that's a little bit more complicated. For a, for a, a uniform distribution of mass, the calculation is a little, is, is more difficult. It's more difficult. And oftentimes, most of and not all the time, most of the time, it involves Integration, okay? Integration and differentiation. This course is not a uh, differentiation. Since this course is not a calculus-based course, we don't do this calculation for you, but at least I give you the result that you can consult during an exam or, or, or whenever you are doing some calculations, okay? So the simplest, uh, the simplest continuous distribution, the simple continuous distribution is that of a ring of mass M, okay? and radius r. This one, this one is not difficult to calculate. And there's a reason why it's not difficult to calculate. This one, in other words, in other words, you do not need the calculus. To find out, to find out its uh, moment of inertia, I. So let's go here. I'm gonna come up with a, another. Consider now a ring. I'm gonna draw what. Now it's going to be to appear to be a ring. No fill. And I'm going to make it relatively thick. Okay, to give you the impression that it is a ring. This ring has a mass M and a radius R. I'm gonna put it, yeah, like, oh, not this one. This one right here. Mm -hmm. Here you go, here's the radius. Mass M, the radius R I'm gonna put elsewhere. I'm gonna put it right in here. And radius R. Okay. How do we calculate the moment of inertia of this ring? 
there's a rather quick way of calculating that because this ring has a symmetry with respect to its mass distribution. Okay. And I'm going to show you how he go. Notice that we have uh, in the case of this ring, we have uh, several little sections of mass, right? Right in here. And I'm going to put it uh, in a different color so you can visualize those sections. Here you go. This ring here has this section here, has this delta M. I'm going to put it red, red color. Yeah. OK. And uh, this little mass distribution has a mass that I'm going to call it delta M. OK? And I'm going to put it in red. So you, you know what I'm talking about. This little mass distribution delta M in this ring alone has a moment of inertia that's going to be given by delta M times M R times R squared. Make sense? Okay. You believe that? This you have this mass distribution, but don't forget it is the moment of inertia with respect to this axis here. Okay. Is the moment of inertia with respect to this axis right here. This axis of rotation. I'm gonna do better than that. Go format shape. No, not that I want. I want the size and position like that. You go. Point two, point one. Yeah, better. That's my axis of rotation. And I'm going to name this axis of rotation O, an axis that passes through the center of the ring. Oh, what happened? Oh, right here. And it is perpendicular to its plane. OK? If you get another little mass distribution, located elsewhere in the in this ring what's gonna happen you're going to get exactly the same moment of inertia of this guy yo here you go i'm gonna put it in a different position here you go right here okay and I'll call this one delta M prime. Delta M prime because it's located at a different position. It's still going to be the same moment of inertia, delta M prime R squared. Okay? And so on. Can you picture that? Okay, I'm gonna put the other one. Here we go. Another infinitesimal mass distribution. Elsewhere. And I'll call this one delta M2 prime. Delta M2 prime is going to have a moment of inertia, delta M2 prime R square two with respect to that axis, and so on. If now, if the ring has uniform mass density, okay, then all those delta m's are going to have the same density themselves. If this one is delta m and this one is delta m prime, that's because the length of this one is different from the length of this one. If this one is delta m2 prime, different from delta m prime and different from delta m, again, that's because this, this section here of the mass is different 
the length of this, this, this section is different from the other two, okay? However, if we make everyone the same length, okay? Exactly the same length, the mass is going to be the same if the density of the ring is the same, okay? As a result, we can conclude that by adding all those little infinitesimal masses, we are going to get a net mass that's going to be equal to m and a moment of inertia that's going to be m times r squared. But don't forget that this reasoning applies only for this specific axis here, axis O, okay? That's the simplest moment of inertia for a continuous distribution of mass that we can discuss here at this level in this course. Everything else, I will have to give you the formula. You either memorize or you just keep it in a safe place, right? And here you go. Uh, we can write that down. Find, treat it as an example, right? Example. Find the moment of inertia of a of a uniform angular distribution of mass ring angular with two ends, huh? A ring of net mass M and radius R, right? Solution. Okay. Uniform, huh? Uniform. Oh, by the way, there's more, right? About an axis that passes through the center of the ring and is perpendicular, perpendicular to its plane. Okay? Solution. One, divide the ring in several small arc sections of same length. I'll call it delta S, delta S, okay? Delta S of same length delta S. I already put that. Okay. Each one of these arcs will have a moment of inertia given by you go. Delta M equal to, you know, even, even we're gonna put it this way, delta M over delta, oh, delta S, okay, equal to what? Net mass divided by two, Pi R, right? Divide by the circumference of the ring. No, because uh, okay, and each one of these arcs will have a moment of inertia given by. Uh, let's see. Let's let's put better. I'll get to this one first. No moment of inertia given by I delta M. R is square, right? Like that. Like that. Uh, 
Uh, oh my goodness. Ai, 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 ai. Continuous with stars. Set number in values. Three. You go. Yeah, see? He doesn't obey me. Ah, okay. Here you go. Since the ring has a, a uniform mass distribution, we, and I'm going to do the following. I'm going to put here a subscript I. Okay, subscript I. See, the ring has a uniform mass distribution. We also have. Delta M over delta S is going to be big M over 2 pi R, which is the circumference of the ring. And delta M becomes delta S, right? Since we divided every section with the same delta S, we do have uh, that delta M I is going to be equal to delta M J. Okay. The last one is consequence. The fact that the ring at a uniform mass distribution. Okay. Another way of writing that, okay, is to name this guy here. Uh, no, let's see, let, let's leave this way. Okay. Next. What do we do next? Continue numbering, let's see. Uh, keep on showing eight there. That's okay. Continue number star, set numbering value. Gotta do it another way. Good. Good. The moment of inertia of the full ring will then be given by, be given by, okay, the sum of every, of the moment of inertia of every infinitesimal ring. You got it? And summation. I from one to N where N is a very large number. And then we can go another step here. I sub I is going to be given by this. Okay, and let's not forget that R. And don't forget the thing here is initially supposed to be in a in between parentheses because R squared is the same for every delta M I. We can put it outside the summation sign. But let's not forget that every little mass distribution has the same value delta M, right? And here we get, we can simplify to M alone. And by the way, we, if we sum everything here in the summation, what we're gonna get? We're gonna get the net mass of the ring. That's the proof, mathematical proof for the Moment of inertia of the ring. Oh.
moment of inertia of the ring, mR squared. And we usually put the M in front of the R. But again, don't forget, it is a, with respect to the axis that pass through the center of the ring and is perpendicular to the plane of the ring. Okay. For a cylindrical tube, you know? For a cylindrical tube, we have the same result. Okay, which is I equal to MR square. However, for a circle, uh, for a for a disk, okay. For a disk, the moment of inert I is going to be what? It's going to be very similar to what we got, but we're not going to derive how to get that again because we need the calculus to do that. For a cylinder, for a solid cylinder, we also have the same moment of inertia. Okay. For a rod of length L and mass M with the rotational axis perpendicular to the rod and passing through its center of mass, which is the middle of the rod. They are all, all those things here are uniform distribution, okay? You have this one here and so on, okay? Uh, we can get at the same rod uh, rotational axis but then pass through one of its ends, okay? We get something like that. For a solid sphere, mass M with rotational axis passing through the center of mass of the sphere, we get something like that, and so on, and so on, okay? And I'm going to emphasize here for the above eyes, right? The axis passes through the center of the mass, uh, this, uh, the center of the object, of the object and is perpendicular to the plane of the object. Okay, a different axis is gonna have a different value for the moment of inertia. So here you go, here's the axis for the, for the ring. And then if you want to draw a disc, the disc is going to be like that. And I don't need The, there you go, I'm going to get here with a different color so you can see uh, moment of inertia with respect to this axis. Huh? Okay. If you have a tube instead, let me draw a tube here for you. Here you go. Here's a tube. Already have one here. Tube axis of rotation 
passing, bring it to the top, bring to front, good. And I'm gonna change the color of the guy, make it a little bit thicker as well. Okay, uh, and I'm going to mark, I'm going to mark the, the plane, right? Of the circle there. I'm going to also show that the radius of this tube is R, I'm gonna put the R right in here. This is the axis of rotation. And we continue through. Like that. Like that. And then the axis of rotation continue past the Like that. That would be, and then, like I said, you know, the moment of inertia for this one would be MR square. Okay. The next would be a cylinder, a solid cylinder. Uh, I don't need this one anymore. The mass of is this one right here, and I'm gonna put here in the center of. And now we're going to talk about a solid cylinder, right? If it's a solid cylinder, I have to adjust here my, my cylinder in such a way. Let me move this guy out of here. In such a way. Okay, and yeah. Now I get it, right? Bring it to the front. This one also must be brought to the front. Yeah, but then we have to cut it down somewhere around here and extend this dashed line right here. Uh, and but but we have to bring to the front as well. Yeah, we have to bring to the front as well. As a solid cylinder, and I'm going to write it here. Solid cylinder. Here is going to be cylindrical tube. Cylindrical tube. Here's going to be a disk. And this one here is going to be a ring. Okay. 951. Let's take a look at how your book illustrates that. Launch. 
chapter nine, right in here. Uh, action, the action of forces and torques on rigid objects, rigid objects in equilibrium, see, angular momentum. Uh, interesting. Huh, let me see, maybe it's here. Rolling motion, center of acceleration, moment of inertia. Okay, let's take a look here throughout the, the book. Okay, and torque. Take your understanding, let's see, put at it, center of gravity, let's see. Object. Second law of motion, see here. Okay, moment of inertia, right here. Okay. Okay, now we have it. Single hollow, uh, single hollow cylinder or hoop. Okay, solid cylinder or disc. That's the table I was looking for. The moment of inertia for those different distributions, okay? That's what I just did. Okay, and that's uh, nine point two, and yeah, that's going to be the angular angular momentum now, rotational work and energy. Moment of inertia of a body, right here. And moment of inertia of a body is Newton's second law for rotational motion about a fixed axis, okay? And let's... I'm going to expand that table that I wrote for you before. Right in here. Inertia. What else do you have to know about that stuff, right? So we have other things here that you gotta know. Okay. In addition to those parameters, we have what we call the linear kinetic energy. Now that we have the equation for the moment of inertia, we can write down, you know, half. You already know that the kinetic energy given in joules for the linear kinetic, the translation of kinetic energy, okay, is going to be half mv squared, right? But what about here? Okay. Here is going to be slightly different. All you have to do is substitute the linear mass by the angle, linear inertia by the angular inertia, and the linear velocity by the angular velocity. The units is going to be exactly the same. It's not going to be any different. And we can calculate that. We can prove that mathematically. What else do you have here? Okay, the idea of work. 
right? The idea of work. Remember, the idea of work is what? Force times distance, right? Force times distance. You can even put delta, delta D or delta X better. Well, it's also going to be joules. But what about the work for angular quantities? The work for angular quantities is not difficult to remember. It's going to be the angular force times the angular displacement. Like that. What's going to be the unit here? You know, the unit here is going to be Newton times meter, right? This guy is going to be Newton times meter. And this one here is going to be radians. But don't forget that radians is a unitless unit. So it's going to be Newton times meter times radian. But don't forget that radians is a unitless unit, which is equal to Nm, OK? which is nothing but joules itself. Well, get this guy here better. Work. And then we have this work kinetic energy theorem. Work kinetic energy theorem. Right, which is nothing but a, an expression for the network. An expression for the network is going to be the final kinetic energy. I'm going to put without the minus the initial kinetic energy, the translation of. Here, I'm even going to emphasize that is the translational kinetic energy. And here, I'm going to emphasize that this is what? The rotational kinetic energy. And then we can copy and paste right here. But let's not forget that's going to be the rotational kinetic energy. Initial rotational kinetic energy. Let's not forget too that that work should come before kinetic energy. I'm just changing order here. We need the definition of work before we get the to the definition of kinetic energy. And then what else do we have? Momentum. Momentum, you already know, linear momentum is MV. And kilograms meter per second. Well, just like we had before, okay, in order to get the right, the angular momentum, which is we represent by the letter L. All we have to do is to replace the unit, the parameter, the angular parameter for the mass, which is the moment of inertia, and replace the linear velocity by the angular velocity omega. Let's see what's going to be this unit here. You already know that I has units of kilogram meter square. And angular momentum has units of radians per second, right? So don't forget radians is a unitless unit. Oh, this one, you got unitless unit, kilogram meter square per second, which is this unit here is different from this unit, right? I'm going to emphasize 
where it's different. What else do we need? Conservation of momentum. What's the condition for conservation of momentum? Net force must be equal to zero. Here we do not need a unit. And here is the net torque equal to zero. And what I want to do, let's see, I want to, we need to go for our break, right? Let's make sure I got everybody attendance here. I'm going next, when you come back, we're going to do some examples so you can fixate this idea more easily. And who came? Let's see, Gael, are you there, Gael? Gael Garcia, no, he's not there. Who else? Let's see, lecture. Do, 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 do. Sky, are you there, Sky? Here. Okay, thank you. Gael Garcia, I don't see him. Marco Sanchez is here. He's here. Catherine, Catherine Pacheco. I don't see her there. Actually, Zoom. I don't see. Let's see. Eight. Um, who who is missing here from my? Uh, Camden is here, right? Yeah, we got C is here. Ah, okay, we're in good shape. Just the other C. And let's go for a break from 10.05 a.m. to 10.20 a.m. Any questions? Okay, so I'll see you in 15 minutes. Back here, and there is one more line here that I have to calculate, new, I have to display here for you, Newton's second law, okay? Newton's second law. The angular expression for Newton's second law, just follow according to the, the here is this Newton, But now it's going to be net torque instead of net force. Angular inertia times ac angular acceleration. And Newton meter. The unit of torque is Newton meter. What I want to do, I want to spell out everything here that we did for this chapter, following the book. Here you go, here's your textbook. Action on the forces, action on forces and torques on rigid object, what he's doing here. He's showing here in this case, the case of pure translational motion. There's no rotation whatsoever. And then we can have a combination of translational motion and rotational motion. That's all he's doing here. And we have to take, uh, in account the translational motion of objects as well. Keep in mind that up to now, we are talking just about motions of particles, point particles. Point particles is just a point that has no dimension whatsoever. And because a point that has no dimension whatsoever, we cannot ascribe a rotational motion to a point, right? When we got to this point here, in which we're dealing with rigid object, now we have to cover rotational motion as well. And that's what he's doing here. And the definition of torque, I'm just summarizing what uh, what we have done. Right here, go. He, he's doing exactly the same thing that I did before. 
exemplifying how the torque can vary, can vary depending on the application of the for how the force is applied and at which point the force is applied, right? Here's an example of force and torque as well. That's 9.1. Let's action of forces and torques on rigid objects. 9.1. Action of forces and torques of on rigid objects. Rigid bodies. I call it, I like to call it rigid body. And then rigid objects, rigid bodies in equilibrium, 9.2. Rigid bodies in equilibrium. Net force equal to zero, net torque is equal to zero. We cover that as well. We did this example before, right? You can look at this example too. Next one should be 9.3, center of gravity. Very important to mention that. Now, form, formally, what's the center of gravity? I didn't mention that, but formally, the center of gravity is a point where we can state where the weight is applicable, is applied to, okay? So if you have this rod here, it's a uniform rod distribution. So we can state that the net, the, the weight of this rod is applied exactly at the middle of this object because it's uniformly distributed, okay? And that point is called the center of gravity, also the center of mass. Under certain circumstances, it will, it will coincide with the center of mass as well. Center of gravity and center of mass are not exactly the same, but under most circumstances, for the sake of this course, the center of gravity coincides with the center of mass, okay? Center of gravity, ninth center of gravity, for the sake of this course, of this course, the center of gravity coincides with the center of mass. Unless we are talking about the very long object that extends through the Earth's orbit, then the center of mass is going to be different from the center of gravity. Think about a, a structure that are a thousand miles long and extends from the Earth's surface all the way down into into, into low Earth's orbit, the center of gravity of this structure is going to 1,000, let's say, 1,000 kilometers. Yeah, 1,000 kilometers we, we reach, we are above low Earth's orbit. Now, in this specific case, the center of mass is not going to coincide with the center of gravity. 9.4. Newton's second law for rotational motion. Okay, it will, which was the last expression that I put there. Newton's second law of rotational motion. And how, how can we use Newton's second law for rotational motion? Okay, in this specific case, in this specific case, the airplane can, can be considered as a point particle, which has a moment of inertia of mass times R squared, right? And see this alpha here, this alpha is not supposed to be a superscript, it's supposed to be right here, times alpha. 
That would be the torque that this propeller is making on this airplane. Okay, so Ft times R is gonna, is gonna be another expression for the torque. Ft times R is gonna be equal to Mr squared times alpha. That's for a point particle. But let's, of course, don't forget that for continuous distributions of mass, the MR square is replaced by the moment of inertia I, just like it has right here. It is written right here. And here, different moment of inertia. For some reason, he didn't, put, he didn't write down the moment of inertia of the cylinder of hoop, right? But he wrote down the moment of inertia for the other ones. Torque, analytic saw motor, let's see, rotational work and kinet and, and energy. Let's go next one. Uh, figure. Okay. Rotational work and energy, that's 9.5. 9.5. And energy. And energy is not kinetic energy, but energy. We cover that as well. And you can do some examples here. Pratsy, uh, solving those examples at home. Here you go. So here you go. Total mechanical energy now is not just MV's, half of MV squared plus gravitational potential energy, but it's also going to be given by this additional term, which is the rotational kinetic energy. And now that's what the total mechanical energy is all about, right? So I can write that down in my table, you know, mechanical energy. Mechanical energy here in this case is gonna be kinetic energy plus potential energy. The unit for that is the joule, but now this one is going to be different. It's going to be kinetic energy plus potential energy, but then you're going to get an additional term that's going to be the rotational kinetic energy, which with units equal to joules as well. And we can solve problems of rolling, rolling cylinders. It's a very interesting situation. You get a hollow cylinder, you get a, a solid cylinder. They're gonna, they're gonna race along this ramp. Which one is gonna get down there first? Okay. That, uh, the one that gets there first is gonna be that one that has the least Rotational inertia. Okay. And you can have conservation, you can use conservation of energy in this case. Final energy is equal to initial mechanical energy. Okay, don't forget that we have. Uh, a term here for potential energy as well. And you do that for one cylinder, for the tube, and then you do that for the solid cylinder. Which one is going to get there earlier, before? It's gonna, which one is going to win the race, right? It's going to be the solid cylinder because it has a moment of inertia that's lower than the moment of inertia of the other. The cylinder has a moment of inertia of half uh, mR square. The hollow cylinder has a moment of inertia as mR square. Then we have this case of angular momentum.
9.6 angular momentum. Okay. In the case of angular momentum, initial angular momentum is going to be equal to final angular momentum if the net torque applied to the object is zero. Okay, here we go. Let me write it down here. Angular, here we go. Linear momentum is conserved whenever net force is zero, right? So we have the same thing. Angular momentum is conserved whenever net torque is zero. And there's a very nice example of that. Here you go, the case of this, this is skater. Everybody has seen that on TV, right? If you have a skater with a vet, with his or her arms extended, and the skater is rotating about his or her axis along the body, the angular velocity is one, but once it contracts the arms, the angular velocity increases. Why is that? Because the fact that she's closing down her arms is decreasing her moment of inertia. When she decreases her moment of inertia, something must give in. The angular velocity must, must decrease. The situation goes just exactly like that, here you go. Mathematically speaking, it is, you know, assume, uh, assume a skater has only rotational motion, okay? And the skater is rotating about his, her axis, he, uh, about an axis, about an axis that passes through her body, right? Here's her body. Here's her body. A skater is upright. A skater is upright, huh? Let's put this, it's upright. And is, uh, is rotating about an axis that passes through his, her body. The skater has only rotational motion. And his, her arms are extended. What happens to the skater if he, she, right? He, she contract his, her arms. Right? That's an example here. Solution, right? You know, hint. The torque in the skater is zero. The net torque. The net torque applied to the skater is zero. To the skater is zero. Let's see if I have an illustration here. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have an illustration here to show you. But the situation is somewhat like that, okay? Situation is like that. You know, here's the skater, right, with the arms extended. The 
Ether moves the arms, expand it, and here you go. Here's the floor. Like that. The skater is rotating about this axis. Here, this skater has an initial moment of inertia and an initial angular velocity. To the script. And then, just like I said, the skater contracts with her arm. Right? And here's going to have a final moment of inertia and final angular velocity. We can even illustrate. Uh, I don't know. That's okay. Leave this way. Okay. And how, what's going to be the final angular velocity in terms of the initial and final moment of, moment of inertia and the initial angular velocity? Goes like that. This case is upright and is rotating about an axis. The path is her body. This case has only rotational motion, are extended and has a moment of inertia, IF, okay? What happens to the skate if she contracts her arms with a resulting in a moment of inertia, I'm not. Okay. The initial angular velocity is known. The initial angular velocity is non and if is greater than i not. Okay, so there is no torque applied to the skater because there is no torque applied to the skater. Apply it to the skater. Comma, angular momentum is conserved or L final LF equal to L naught. But Angular momentum can also be written in terms of IF times omega F. And I and then we have this relationship here. Okay. Right? All you have to do is solve is solve for I sub F. And you get something like that. Let's see here. I F. Oh, it's all the way around, sorry. Uh, no, wait a minute. 
the net torque applied to the skitter is zero. Ah, okay, it's all the way around. Okay, it's like that. I not is greater than I have. Okay. So what do you end up having? Because it's I not is greater than I F. Omega F is gonna be greater than omega naught. Let's see if we got it right. Uh we go. I didn't write it down here, but I not is greater than I F. Okay. That's one example of conservation of angular momentum. And that's the last topic on this chapter. So we are covering, we cover all of that here. Ten forty-five now. Any questions before we move forward? Okay, so what I want to do now is simple harmonic motion. That's chapter 10. I'll put it in the next page. Okay, so the question is, why do we study simple harmonic motion? It's a very important reason for that. Okay, because it has several important applications in real life. The most obvious one being that the way we keep time, we can use simple harmonic motion to build very accurate and, uh, very accurate and precise time pieces. That's the whole, whole thing about simple harmonic motion. Okay, the story of timekeeping, but not just the story of timekeeping, that uh, the story of modern timekeeping, right? Modern timekeeping using simple harmonic motion starts with Galileo Galilei. You can consult that Wikipedia. Wikipedia has a very nice article about that. Wikipedia has a very nice article about that. The story goes that Galileo Galilei was attending a, a church service when he noticed that the chandelier there in the church was oscillating back and forth, okay? Think about that, right? You know, lots of people have noticed that before. You know, before, even before, before Galileo Galilei. Many people have noticed that when the wind would come by a chandelier, the chandelier would move back and forth, but they didn't take it as far as Galileo went, okay? Galileo, when he saw that, that motion, he starts thinking, look, uh, what, uh, what happened to the period of this chandelier, you know? That's what he starts thinking about when he saw the motion of this chandelier. You know, what, what does, What's the period of this chandelier if he moves it to higher and higher amplitudes, larger and larger angles, okay? And he starts thinking about that, and he discovered that uh, the period of motion of the chandelier changes very little if you increase the initial angle of the chandelier. And it was at this moment that he starts thinking that uh, an object that oscillates back and forth which today we call a pendulum, could be used as a timekeeping device, as the, as the element of a timekeeping device. Okay, very important. The story goes that Galileo Galilei was attending church when he noticed that the chandeliers of the church was oscillating around the vertical axis. 
vertical direction, right? Of the, uh, not around the vertical direction, around an axis, an axis that was perpendicular, perpendicular to the vertical direction of the chandelier, of the chandelier. Just by looking at it, he starts thinking about the type of motion that the chandelier is describing. And if he could use this type of motion to build a timekeeping device or even an element of a timekeeping device to build an element, an improved element, element of a timekeeping device. And he started working in that. He was at the end of his life. He was under house arrest when he started working in, in that, uh, in this problem. He was under house arrest in his own state. He was blind by that time already because he was observing the sun during his lifetime and he became blind because of that. So he had to, to get help from his son. Now his son started working with him on that on this project, okay? And Galileo Galilei came with the project, with the blueprints of a new timekeeping device, a new timekeeping device that used this type of motion of the chandelier that we call the pendulum, okay? The motion of the chandelier, motion of the chandelier that Galileo saw, Galileo observed, is very similar to that of a pendulum. And what is a pendulum? A pendulum is it's a very simple device. Here you go. It's a string, a string uh, with a negligible mass attached to a point object. It can be a sphere. You displace it from the from the vertical and let it oscillate back and forth. Okay, that's what the chandelier, that's the type of the motion that the chandelier was making. This is what we call the simple pendulum. Simple pendulum. But then there are other types of pendulum too that behave in a rather similar way. Okay, this one, for instance, a bar with a point of rotation on its end. Okay, this type of device is also a pendulum, but we call it a physical pendulum. It behaves slightly different from the simple pendulum. So that's the type of problem that Galileo Galilei proposed to solve. Use a, a pendulum as an element of a timekeeping device. Well, here you go. Okay. Only if he had lived long enough, he could, he could have done that, okay? And he started working on that, but then, but uh, Galileo started working on this problem, working on this problem, but he could not finish because he died, right? Then his son, his son inherited, <laughs> inherited the work and tried to finish, to finish it as well. But he also died prematurely, but he also died prematurely. Inherited his father's work, right?
then it was someone else, you know, then later on, a Dutch guy, a Dutch scientist, started working on it, started working on it, and managed it to create uh, the first mechanical timepiece that used uh, a pendulum. He was very successful, very successful in this in his work, in his work, and it started uh, outfitting, right? Existing mechanical clocks with his pendulum like device. Okay. He was so successful that the new the new timekeeping device outfitted, right? Time keeping device outfitted with the pendulum was so good that uh, it that made that resulted in a device that was 60 times more precise at and at a relatively and at a relatively low cost okay okay remember that right uh, those guys were doing that during the times of the the great navigations okay think about navigating out there in the oceans without a engine in your ship and with very unreliable timekeeping devices Okay, so the fact that we managed to invent a device that was far more precise and accurate was a great help, was to great help to the navigation of the, to the navigation of the time. Okay. Well, this type of motion, this type of motion, a uh, type of motion of a pendulum. is uh, referred as simple harmonic motion, SHM. And that's the type of motion that we're going to study. In addition to pendulums, in addition to pendulum, you can also reproduce this motion with a spring, okay? A spring that's look a spring that uses Hooke's law. Remember looks Hooke's law? Hooke's law, you know, it also has for the elastic force. And by the way, law between quotes, okay? Or the elastic force. The elastic force can be written down in a in a vectorial sh format like that. It's going to be a constant, a constant of the device, a constant of the spring, times the displacement from equilibrium. The displacement from equilibrium collapse. Okay, and in the this is here what this is is the unit vector along the x-axis. If we combine those two quantities here, we can write down that as being the x vector, x position vector. Okay, so let's take a look at the drawing. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I don't have a... Well, I'll, I'll find that. Let's go in a break right now. I have a drawing here of the spring somewhere. 
And let's go in a break right now. And when we return, I'll have that, that slide for you, okay? So take a break from 11 a.m. to 11.15 a.m. Okay. And we'll continue on this topic here. Yeah. So any questions before we go to the break? Okay, so I see you in 15 minutes. So let's talk about the uh, simple harmonic motion and the ideal, in the case of the ideal spring, okay? When we start the simple harmonic motion, we give that we give an example of the pendulum, of the motion of the pendulum. And the pendulum is the simple pendulum, is this one right here. Simple device that you can get out there. And uh, it's very useful. It's amazing that uh, the most useful devices are the one that is simplest one. That once you manage to integrate this simple device to your timekeeping to our timekeeping device you can make it more precise and make it more accurate as well this is one type of simple harmonic motion you can also have this other device that also performs simple harmonic motion the physical pendulum and then you have uh, another type of device that can perform, perform simple harmonic motion as well, which is a mass attached to a spring. Another simple device that's very useful, a spring. Okay? This is spring, you know, if you apply an external force to this spring to the right, you will be able to displace it from the position of equilibrium to another position. As a result, the spring is going to apply a force to the mass as well. And this force that the spring applies, right, right here, this, oh, sorry, I'm not uh, sharing the screen, right? Okay, here you go. So let's, uh, let's review it again. Okay, simple harmonic motion, right? There are different ways of Simulate simple harmonic motion. You can either use a simple pendulum, you can use a physical pendulum, that's something like that, or you can use a spring, a mass attached to a spring. If you displace this mass, uh, this, this figure here illustrates the position of equilibrium of the mass attached to the spring, which is the position where the force that the spring exerts in the mass is zero, okay? If we take the mass out of this position of equilibrium, out of its position of equilibrium, by applying an external force, the spring is going to exert a force in the opposite direction. Here you go. Here's my hand pulling the string, the, 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 the spring, pulling the mass that's attached to the spring, and here's the force that the spring exerts on the mass. Okay, the more, the, the further away you are from the position of the spring, from the position of equilibrium, the larger the force of the spring exerts on the mass. And this force can be mathematically given by this equation that you see right here, Kx. The larger where x is the distance from the position of equilibrium. Okay, in the above equations, in the above equations, x is the distance from the, uh, no, it's the, not the distance, the position from the equilibrium position of the spring, okay? It's the position, it's not the distance. Distance is something else, right?
with this one here. Okay. So the force, this force of the spring increases linearly with x. Okay, once you pull the mass to this position x naught, okay, if you release it now, remember I had this external force here, and now I made the external force equal to zero. What's going to happen? This mass is going to is going to start moving to the left. Initially, the velocity is going to be zero, but the acceleration is going to be maximum because the force is maximum at this position as well. Okay, think about that. The velocity is zero while the acceleration is maximum. It's possible to have something like that. A little bit later, the mass, mass is going to approach the position of equilibrium. Okay, the force is going to decrease, right? It was initially this much larger. The force now it decreased. When the mass passed through the position of equilibrium, the force all that the spring is exerted on the mass is going to be zero. Consequently, the acceleration must be zero. And by the way, here I'm assuming that uh, the force of friction is negligible. But the velocity is going to be maximum. Okay, the mass is going to overshoot this position of equilibrium because the mass has still has some inertia and the inertia is verified by the velocity of the mass different of zero. And the force is going to invert direction as well as the acceleration, even though the velocity is to the left. Okay, until the velocity of the mass is momentarily at rest and the force is maximum as well as the acceleration is maximum. And the whole process repeat back and forth, okay? Here I did a simulation for don't forget, frictional forces are negligible, right? For two oscillations, right? Frictional forces are negligible. I'm gonna, can you picture this type of motion? Here is just a very, qualitative treatment of what happens whenever you attach a spring to a mass. You know, take it out from the position of equilibrium. Release it and let it move by the action of the spring itself. Okay, so let's do that again. Here you go. I put this mass at a given distance from the position of equilibrium, a given position with respect to the position of equilibrium, and release this mass. This spring is going to exert a, what we call a restoring force towards the position of equilibrium that is here at zero. The velocity is going to build up to a certain point. When the mass passes through the position of equilibrium, the force that the spring exerts in the mass is going to be zero, but because the mass has some inertia, has some velocity, it's going to overshoot this position of equilibrium until it compresses the spring to the maximum possible position before it comes to rest, momentarily at rest, right? And oscillate again back to its initial position and keep oscillating back and forth frictional forces are negligible. That's why the mass is not going to stop oscillating. Okay. And this type of motion, okay, in simple harmonic motion, the equations of motion can be written down in terms of sines and cosines, okay? 
That's why it's called harmonic motion because it's written down in terms of a harmonic function. Recall that uh, under uniform circular motion, the exposition of the particle was given by, remember that? Uh oh. Was given by. Was given by something like that. A cosine of theta, remember that? And cosine of theta end up becoming omega t. Okay. Well, it happens that. Uh, Simple harmonic motion has exactly this, this solution as well. Okay, it happens. We cannot derive it here, but it happens that simple harmonic motion also has this very relation that we obtained in uniform circular motion. So there is a There's a, a correlation, a very strong correlation between uniform circular motion, one I mentioned, and simple harmonic motion. Okay, so here you go. It's uh, A cosine of omega t and so on. Okay, where A for SHM, okay, A is going to be the amplitude of motion of the particle. And omega is the angular velocity of the particle. Okay, at this moment in time, at this moment in time, we still do not know how omega is related to the other parameters, okay? But uh, recall from UCM uh, that uh, not only we have something like that, but also we have something like that. I'll call it prime. Oh, even better. I'll call it, uh, yeah, I'll put it prime. Remember that? Sine. It had a negative sign here. Yep. All right. And then we have another relation for the acceleration, I'll call that uh, two prime, a two prime with a negative sign, but then the sign becomes cosine like that. Do you recall that? I'm going to, you know, take this one out. We don't need that anymore. We don't need that anymore. We don't need that anymore. Okay. So we can find out, we can find out Omega 
Oh, we can find how omega relates to the other parameters by applying Newton's second law of motion. Okay. And we do it in the following way. We do like that. You know, net force is equal to mass times acceleration, which by the way, can be written down as mass times the acceleration that we obtain for uniform circular motion, which by the way, applies also to simple harmonic motion. I'm going to go a, another step here. Instead of using A here, I'm going to use that uh, amplitude X naught that you saw in the drawing right here, right? So here we go. Right here, see that's the X naught, that's the amplitude of my motion. E amplitude means the largest possible distance from equilibrium. That's what amplitude stands for. And by the way, this term here can also be written down as X naught times omega. And the next one is still going to be X naught omega square. Here we have units of meter. Here we have units of meters per second. See that? Don't forget radians is a unitless unit. And here we have the unit of meters per second squared, which in terms of units matches what we have for the acceleration. So what I have to do, I have to replace my A2 prime with X naught omega squared. Okay, uh, should be equal here, right? Yeah, here should be equal. Let's not forget that the net force is also equal to the force that the spring applies to the mass. It's gonna be minus kx. And by the way, x, we know how to write x. X can be written like that, okay? So let's see, I'm gonna do that separately so it doesn't, you know? That's one equation, right? Using Newton's second law of motion, right? And using Hooke's law, we have, you know, F net, is equal to F elastic, which is equal to minus Kx, minus Kx not cosine, cosine omega t. Now we make this term equal to this term and look what we get. Okay, cosine, cancel out this cosine. X naught, cancel out with X naught. The minus sign, cancel out with the other side, with the other minus sign. And we will obtain that omega square, at least omega square, right? is given by k divided by m. If you want to know omega, we have to take the square root of this term right here. Like that.
So now we can write down side by side the relation for uniform circular motion and the relation for simple harmonic motion. If you remember what we got for uniform circular motion, you will remember what it's going to be for One, two, three. Simple harmonic motion as well. UCM, SHM, position, velocity, acceleration. Position was given in terms of the velocity or the speed of the particle. In the case for simple harmonic motion, this is given by the angular velocity of the particle, which is square root of k over m times t. or the velocity is something like that. For simple harmonic motion, we still have a negative sign, but just like we have in there, but it's gonna be X naught times omega. So X naught times omega is related to this velocity there of the of the particle under circular harmonic motion. Oh, by the way, it's sine here, right? And here two is supposed to be sine. Okay. This one here is Vx, by the way. And then finally we have the end, the acceleration. And by the way, this is gonna be the X component of the acceleration for uniform circular motion. And this is going to be the acceleration, it's not the X component. Yeah, it is the X component, right? This is a negative sign. Positive, negative, negative. Oh, by the way, here is V. Here is A. Cosine, sine, cosine. Can you see that? X naught, X naught, X naught. Not difficult to memorize, right? X naught, X naught, X naught. Here you have to multiply omega. Here you have to multiply omega square. And then the cosine changes to sine and back to cosine. Okay. Now let us find, let us find the period of oscillation of my mass attached to a spring. Okay. So there is a mathematical procedure that you can take to do that. So how do you do that? Here you go. Here's this guy here. The period of oscillation is that period that takes for the x position to repeat itself, okay? So when when t is equal to t plus the period, you are going to have uh, an equality just like that. That's how we 
find the period by coming up with this equality, okay? And then what, what, how do you come up with the solution? Well, it's very simple. All we have to do here All we have to do here is to sum two pi to the original omega t, and then turn this equality like that. If you go ahead and you expand the right side of the term of the equation, Okay, go, go. We don't need that anymore, right? You can see that this term cancels out with this term, this term. And the period is going to be 2 pi divided by omega. Like that. Which, by the way, depends also on the k and the mass. Okay, M divided by K. Okay, note C. Note C. The larger the mass, the longer the period. Also. Also, the larger the K, in other words, the stiffer the spring is, the shorter the period. Okay. So in addition to the, in addition to the period, what, what, what is the period, right? What is the period? What's the period T, right? What's the period T? There's a very simple answer for that. The period T is how long it takes for a single oscillation to be completed. Okay. The unit of uh, period is the seconds. You cannot, you don't need to write that down, right? That's what the period is. But in addition to the period, there's something else you have to remember. You have to remember. It's called, it's called the frequency. If the period is how long it takes for a single oscillation to complete, comma, the frequency is the inverse, is the inverse or You know,
is how, or how many oscillations you have in a single second, right? See the difference? Let's put side by side here so you can understand. Frequency and video. Period and frequency. Time for a single oscillation. Mm -hmm. Oscillation. Even better, I'm gonna put it like that. Number of seconds, right? Number of seconds for a single oscillation. Number of oscillations for a single second. Can you remember that? Okay, I can even here write that in a different uh, table format. Here you go. Single, go, I'm gonna put that like here. Number of. Number of seconds, right? I'm gonna erase that and gonna one, two, three for a single. Oscillation, can you picture that? Number of seconds for a single oscillation. Number of oscillations, right? For a single second. It's the inverse, right? If here is second, here is oscillation. If here is oscillation, here is second. And I'm going to Those tables are very useful for us to remember important concepts, provided you you put the table in the proper in the proper way, right? Okay, period this number of, of seconds for a single oscillation. Frequency is number of oscillations in a single second. Uh, we're gonna put it like in a single huh? oscillation. Number of seconds in a single oscillation, number of oscillations in a single second. Because one is the inverse of the other, even in this table, you can see that they are inverse, right? Mathematically speaking, it's also going to be given by the inverse by the inverse. Okay gonna be one over F, which is frequency, is equal to the period. And then you solve on the other way. Right? All you have to do is change K and M. Okay. So I'll put side by side here in a more, in a shorter fashion. Here you go, like that. Eleven forty nine. What else? Let's take a look at your book. How is it doing here? Chapter 10, Ideal Spring and Simple Harmonic Motion, right? Go. A spring hooks law. As you stretch the spring, you must apply a force. As you compress the spring, you must apply a force. And there's a linear relation between this force and the distance. Okay. <clears throat> 
This spring is a very useful device. It's used not just for timekeeping purposes, but it can also be used for measuring other stuff, other things, like in the tire pressure gauge. You can use a spring to measure the pressure in your tire. You can use the spring to measure your mass as well. Okay? A spring properly cal calibrated can, can, can be used to determine your mass. And here, Hooke's law, restoring force, the same one I told you about. Go. If you compress the spring to the left, the force is going to be to the right. If you extend the spring to the right, the force is going to be, the force of the spring is going to be to the left. Okay. And the position of the mass is given by this graph here. Okay, if you plot X against T, you should see a sinusoidal or harmonic function. It can be either a cosine or a sine, depends what are the initial conditions are, okay? In this case here, he's using a cosine function. He's using a cosine function because he displaced the mass initially. From its initial from its position of equilibrium. So initially it displays the best from its position of equilibrium. Okay. Here's another situation, okay, in which you can put the mass in the vertical direction. The spring, the mass of the spring in the vertical direction. It still undergoes simple harmonic motion. I can be proven rather easily. Now he's doing here the correlation between simple harmonic motion and the reference circle. Okay, this is an experiment that can be done if you have a mass undergoing uniform circular motion and you have this, this light, this all, all those lights here shining along this plane what's going to happen, you know, you're going to see a, a shadow in this paper that draws a harmonic motion, that draws a harmonic function. That's how harmonic motion correlates with the uniform circular motion. Okay? So, uh, mass undergoing circular motion has an X position that uh, oscillates about the center of the circle. Okay, here is one cycle or one period. Just like I mentioned before. So that's 10.1, 10.2. Okay. Let's take a look at this example. The diaphragm of a loudest speaker moves back and forth in simple harmonic motion to create sound. Actually, that's exactly what happens, okay? Objects that undergo simple harmonic motion, they emit sound of a given frequency. And that's what speakers are all about. The speakers is a diaphragm that moves back and forth, just like in simple harmonic motion, to produce a sound. But the, if the frequency is proper, if you have the right frequency, the speaker that moves back and forth will produce a, a sound that you can hear, okay? The frequency of the motion is one kilohertz, it's a thousand hertz, and the amplitude is 0.2 millimeters. What's the maximum speed of the diaphragm, uh, okay? Think about that, you know, example in the book. Let's take a look here, example in the book. Frequency, one kilohertz. Amplitude, point two millimeters, point two zero millimeters. A, 
simple harmonic motion, simple harmonic motion A. What's the maximum speed of the diaphragm? What's the maximum speed of the diaphragm? B. Where in the motion does this maximum speed occur? Where in the motion does this maximum speed occur? The motion. Okay, let's go back to our equations of motion. Here you go. That's the equation of motion right in here. Here's the speed, right? Maximum velocity is whenever the sign here is equal to one. Okay. From the equations of motion for simple harmonic motion, from the equations of motion of simple harmonic motion, the velocity is given by, go. Maximum velocity, even better, it should be, he should have written maximum speed, okay? Maximum speed, right, is given by this term right here. V max. And now, oops, uh, okay, he didn't like it, like that, oh, didn't like that either, huh, interesting. Let's see, we can put VMX, okay, now we got it. VMX is given by that. And now we have, he didn't give us K, he didn't give us M, but give us the gave us the frequency. He also gave us x naught. Okay, x naught, x naught was given, but not k nor, but k and m were not are not known. Are not known. Okay. However, X naught and, and F are given, but KDM are not known. How do we solve this problem? How do we solve this problem, right? Okay. We just go back, we just go back to the relation. Or F. Let's take a look here. What F here? Here you go. We do not have K, we do not have M, but we do know that the square root of K over M divided by two pi is going to be equal to the frequency. See here? This term here is exactly the same as this term here. Right? And then we can here write that as two pi equal to this square root. Replace this one by the other one here. Substituting in the equation for Vmax, substituting into the equation for Vmax. We have 
Almost done, right? Two pi f. And now we can calculate x naught is given, right? 0.2 millimeters. Let's take a look here. 0.2 millimeter, yeah. A thousand kilohertz. You know, a two millimeters is gonna be point two is gonna become uh, times a thousand. It's gonna become two hundred, right? No, it's not two hundred. It's twenty. It's gonna become twenty. Twenty times six is gonna be one hundred twenty. Point two. Point two. No, it's two hundred millimeters. Wait a minute. Two two hundred millimeters times two. 400 millimeters times three, 1200 millimeters. Let's see what they say. And I'm doing that by heart. Let's see what they say here in the book. Oh yeah, 1200. 1200 millimeters is around uh, 1.2 meters per second. That's good. It is we see my, my error of the calculation, right? And the speed is zero at the, at the moment in the diaphragm, diaphragm comes momentarily to rest, okay? And at the point where it has maximum, maximum amplitude. Okay, it's 12.01 already. And any questions that you have? Do you have any questions? Don't forget, we have an exam on Wednesday, right? I'll try to do everything that I can to help you out on this exam. Try to make it as simple as I can. And hopefully everybody's gonna feel happy better this time. Okay, so see you on Wednesday. Over one. Ah. Uh.